Our next speaker is Dr. Samin Taraj Kumar. Dr. Kumar graduated in dentistry from Singapore in 2001 and medicine from London in 2006. He is both the Malo Dental Director and the Zaga Center Director for Singapore. Both appointments are due to his surgical and prosthetic training and experience in full arch implantology and zygomatic implants. He has a particular interest in ceramic dental implantology and a particular love for the routine use of platelet-rich fibrin. Dr. Kumar has published papers in internationally peer-reviewed journal, and in 2020, he was elected as the council member to the Singapore Dental Association. Dr. Kumar works in Singapore as a general dental surgeon, focusing primarily in dental implantology and oral surgery. Dr. Kumar is also a visiting implant surgeon at Malmin Dental London, United Kingdom. Let's welcome Dr. Samin Taraj Kumar. Dr. Kumar, please. Hi, everybody. Let me just stare at my screen. Okay. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank Osteopore for giving me this opportunity to present uh, this lecture to you. Uh, a general dentist and um, new biomaterials specific to dental implant surgery. Uh, this is one arena of uh, one segment of the dentistry which I've grown to love. And I find that whenever there's a new biomaterial, right. So, with regards to dental implant surgery, it's always that we are faced with a problem. It's either a soft tissue problem or whether it's a bony defect. Um, more and more of us are placing implants uh, on an immediate implant basis in terms of wanting to reconstruct and provide a natural strut for healing to occur. Um, of course, many years ago, this was not the norm. Um, but now we know that in needed implants can be placed quite successfully. In many instances, we see complex uh, implants being uh, both placed, uh, restored with a scaffold of uh, some form of particulate bone grafting material, uh, a membrane, sometimes even tax to keep these things in place. So today I'd like to talk to you about uh, biomaterials in general, some of the biomaterials that we use in uh, dental plant surgery, just a bit about the categories and classifications of uh, dental plant materials and the service of implants. And I have uh, been recently, since 2017, using uh, ceramic implants. So I'll just share some examples about that. Let's talk about some uh, other augmentation materials used and also particularly about osteomesh and why I have grown to like osteomesh in my, uh, to keep it in my uh, general armamentarium and some tips that I could give you, which might be of use when you perform surgery. So when we look at any form of uh, bone augmentation material, um, of course, there is the dental implant material, typically of which all of you will be familiar is titanium and more so recently uh, ceramic, uh, zirconia. Uh, the purpose of the bone augmentation material, of course, is to, is threefold, uh, obviously to restore volume and, and contour to the extraction site. Um, the next thing, of course, is to maintain the clot. Um, and the clot is a very, very important part of this, of course. Uh, if a patient is a smoker, we see instantly how, how much of panic you would be when you see there's no bleeding. Uh, of course, bleeding is the mother of healing and with an appropriate sort of um, coagulum that's formed, um, this will, permeate your bone augmentation material. And of course, the membrane keeps everything inside. So there I was thinking, how am I to try and just use the benefit of the coagulum and just a mesh alone? And of course, this is a very, very scary situation because we don't want to be doing experiments in our patients. But of course, we want to try and push the boundaries of science. So I spoke to Osteopore and they very graciously decided to work on a research project with me. And since then, we've come along with some findings. And I'm here to share this with you. Um, let's look at the types of a dental implant based on the type of biological response. The three types of uh, uh, implants in terms of their biodynamic activity, 
the ones that we use very commonly is bioinert, which is uh, pure titanium. And the ones that are active are things like hydroxyapatite. Um, zirconia is a very interesting uh, material, of course. It's uh, something which is biotolerant. And the benefit of a, a zirconia implant versus a titanium implant is that it actually likes gingiver and it actually improves the healing and cuff around the implant, thereby reducing the, uh, the, the likelihood of peri implantitis. Note, I say reduce doesn't completely mean that you would have an implant without peri implantitis. But of course, in the cases I've seen, certainly in my, my own experience and others, uh, the, the, the risk of peri implantitis is uh, significantly reduced. And I'll explain why in a, in a short while. Different types of uh, implants, uh, smooth machined, textured, coated. And of course, every implant company wants to be different. And they come various versions of all these various threads, grooves, notches, uh, even the, uh, the pitch and tilt of the threads as well. And of course, there are more and more uh, implant companies spraying a coat of hydroxyapatite, and they have both a rough and a polished combination. And they've also have uh, crystal implants, subcrystal implants, supercrystal implants. Um, the point is, there's a huge volume and number and a heterogeneous spectrum of implants. You choose the one that you're most comfortable with, but you would need to pair or work with a um, biomaterial for bone grafting in support for the implant system you use. Now, all of us, the vast majority of us would, would be very familiar with the BioOS and um, BioGuide, of course. Now, as you guys know, BioOS is of bovine um, uh, origin and the membrane that we use, equiposine. And what we use together to achieve the result, many of us, always feel that BioOS never fully integrates. And the reason for this is it's very clear. It's not your body's, it's not your own. And so it doesn't completely dissolve to uh, carbon dioxide and water. And of course you want something that does that because it's truly safe to patients. And an increasing amount of patients are more and more concerned as to what materials are being put into their bodies as well. So let's talk about metal versus ceramic. As you can see over here, you can see the hint, the gray hue produced by a titanium implant just below the gingiva. And note in this instance, you can tell this patient has already got a thick gingival biotype. Metal implants in general are unsightly. Of course, if the patient has a very, very thick amount of buccal bone and uh, thick gingiva, they don't, show the, they don't show through the gingiva. But in many instances, if they do, this problem will mean uh, a, a cosmetic failure. So if you have a zircona implant, it doesn't behave like this, okay? More so with regards to titanium implants, we know that in de depending on the studies you read, up to one third of dental implants which are made of titanium attract and collect more plaque compared to that of zircona implants. So there's a 33% chance of peri-implantitis on a titanium implant. Uh, so it's almost telling a patient that from day one, your dental implant that I've placed is a, the uh, titanium implant is unfortunately bound to start to fail. And this is of course, because there's a complex a zoo of microflora in the mouth, you can't prevent this. Um, we also know that plaque, ad heat, uh, uh, plaque addition is much higher in titanium implants compared to zircona implants. And of course, the reason for the periimplantitis is the plaque adhesion, long-term uh, adhesion will contribute uh, massively to the progressive failure of an implant. Um, there used to be a problem with regards to how people viewed zirconia implants and um, the strength of a zirconia implant was always brought into question. And people would say that, oh, you know what? Because of the implant being overloaded, there's a very high chance of fracture, as you can see over here, in which case then zirconia implants are not safe to be used. Well, that was studies 20, 30 years ago. And most of the problems at that point of time was the fact that the zirconia implants were made at a very, very unfavorable narrow diameter. And the lots of damaging surface treatments that had been made, uh, including aggressive alumina sand blasting. And of course, without understanding how the implant actually worked, a lot of these implants were overloaded. Um, as you guys already know, zirconia implants are obviously more expensive than titanium implants. But for the patients who are looking for something which is uh, holistic in patients who do not want any form of metal in their body, um, this is the only option there is. Um, there is an interesting lecture that's going to be coming out in the next uh, few weeks or so with regards to how we try and keep, um, uh, you know, 
palps which are having uh, any form of a necrosis and to see how we can maintain the tooth with our extraction. For those patients who need an extraction and do not want to have metal in their mouth and refuse to wear a denture for any reason, a zirconia implant is your only option. Um, with regards to the success rates and the complications, both are equal in terms of having um, the same sort of survivability over more than 10 year studies. And with regards to, to strength and um, loosening or so, they're no different at this point of time. Let's look but, at something uh, Dr. Kumar, can see. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint slide that you can share instead? Because the screen is not uh, fully shared. It's a little bit small. Yeah, is it a PDF that you're sharing? No. Can you not see my slides? Yeah, we can see it. It's just that it's not um, uh, full, covering the screen fully. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's, it's maximized on mine. Okay. Is uh, What app are you using? Zoom. Uh, I mean, like... Oh, uh, uh, my PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, maybe I can share the slides on my screen instead. You get, go ahead. Okay, okay, sure. Okay. Sure. Shall I stop the share? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay this is this is a bit of a treat for me of course not to press my own slides but let's look at uh, a famous incident in 1912 a very famous ship a left portsmouth in england it's called the titanic and it obviously sank as we all know but look look at the damage that has happened to it over a period of time from 1912 to 2004 and you can see how much of decay has happened to the ship in terms of all the amount of metal and um, how the surface has actually undergone severe degradation. Then we look on the right hand side where you look at ceramic in this instance of the ceramic jar and you can see there's been no change since five years before Christ, five BC versus and now 2004. And these studies are tantamount to showing you how solid in terms of um, longevity zirconium plants can be versus titanium. Next slide, please. Uh, sure, but uh, you can control the screen um, via your, yeah, I'm giving you access. Okay, so in terms of what is an implant success rate? Now, if a patient is able to bite and comes, comes back to you in two weeks time and says, hey, I'm able to eat and all that, that doesn't constitute success. Uh, in fact, what else doesn't constitute success? If a patient comes back to you, the implant is completely firm, but the patient says, I still have this funny, strange pain, this discomfort when I bite or when I grind my teeth. Um, such things are so-called subjective complaints. To me, unfortunately, that implant is still not successful. However, many criteria that we can use to, to suggest that implant is successful would include, as I said, absence of mobility, absence of any form of peri-implant radiolucency, and an absence of uh, any form of pus. And of course, some other studies go on to tell us about marginal bone resorption and some um, degrees of uh, loss, which include 1.5 millimeters after the first year of loading, may suggest that implants undergoing some form of um, failure. Um, however, for those patients who have implants which do not have mobility, no peri-implant radiolucency, no marginal bone resorption, and still complain of foreign body sensation and dysesthesia and pain. What is the problem? We see this, do we know what we are trying to uh, treat? Um, and certainly I think in my book, I wouldn't consider such a case to be successful, a successful implant case. Next slide. And now uh, enter Zeramex. So Zeramex is a, a Swiss company. Uh, many of you already know about uh, the Zeramex implant. Some of you know it by its uh, other name, Nobel Pearl. Nobel Pearl is um, an OEM version of Zeramex. So Zeramex basically makes it for Nobel. 
And if it's in a white box, it's a Nobel pole. If it's in a pink box, it's a Zeramax implant. And I've been using Zeramax since, uh, since 2017. Next slide, please. As you can see on the top left-hand side, you, you will see a zirconia implant, which is white, classically white. And on the left, you have a, a titanium implant. If you go below that, you will see that the titanium implant has a degree of peri-implantitis, whereas the zirconia implant, in this case, has much less sort of uh, mucosal changes. And the point to note, of course, is that in terms of what is the problem between uh, these two, if you look on the right-hand side, you will see that a titanium implant, and many of us see this, we will see that repeated x-rays will still show a gap between the implant and the bone and be wondering how come it is not completely closed. However, I'm here to tell you that this space will still remain. In the case of zircona implants, we don't see this though. And you will see that the, the bone is and the, and the surface of the implant are completely like almost one. And the reason for that is because you get a form of corrosion layer that forms between the bone and the zircona implant. This hence reduces the potential of uh, ingress of bacteria. And because if you look at the beautiful biocompatibility re uh, response uh, that uh, zirconia has in, in comparison to that of a natural tooth, you'll agree with me that the tissue response around the zirconia implant here is so much better than what, what you can see on the left-hand side. Of course, you would say the crown is not that it's much easier to clean, but in general, the response that a zirconia implant that, that, that you would see if you were to use one is phenomenal. Next slide, please. So let me talk to you about a case. This is, a, uh, unfortunately, my own brother's case. He, he is, um, is now, um, how old is he? 43. And in terms of what happened to him, he came to me and said that he had broken his tooth. He called me up and said, hey, something's wrong. Some tooth is, mine is moving. And he has a history of uh, bruxism. So I saw him promptly in my clinic. And I took out the tooth. And being a good brother, I placed the titanium implant immediately, right? So I placed the implant and I thought it was perfect. It was a very quick procedure. He was on antibiotics as usual. Um, and we restored the implants in four months later. As you can see in the top left-hand side, I've used a Nobel active implant, uh, restored with a zirconia uh, crown. One year later, he comes to me and tells me that the zirconia implant is, sorry, the titanium implant is loose. So I, I tell him that, you know, something is, uh, he's panicking and there's nothing wrong. And I said, maybe the uh, excess cavity, the composite filling that plays that come loose. When I saw him, to my horror, the implant had failed. So I did the next most responsible thing that you could do for your brother or your loved one. You remove the implant and do not place an implant in the same time, right? So you, I allowed another three months of healing. Uh, but by then, of course, I was worried as to what the reason for this potential failure could be. There are many things in my mind, of course, his bruxism, was it a vitamin D deficiency? Was he allergic to something? Now, my brother is, uh, has a history of atopy. And for those who don't know what atopy is, he's, got, you know, he's had childhood asthma, allergic to quite a few things, um, grass, for example. And all of this built the story in my mind that perhaps he might be allergic to potentially titanium. So I then replaced um, the implant. Um, so, well, after waiting three months for healing to occur, I then place the Zeramax uh, P6 implant. Next slide, please. And this is the tissue response around the, the implant. So this is a zirconia implant. And for those who have not seen a zirconia implant before, this is an external hex a P6 uh, implant. External hex implants uh, depends on you know, what school of thought you have and how you prefer to restore your implants. In this instance, you can see the gingival, gingival keratinization around the implant. It's beautiful. It's subgingival, and um, this is the sort of tissue response you would see with most of your zirconia implant cases. And so I, in his case, that the reason why he didn't have a successful implant outcome was potentially the fact that he might have been having a low-grade sort of titanium allergy. Okay, next. This is a, a case too, which is a 46-year-old uh, Chinese lady, and she came in with the unrestorable uh, upper left one. Um, of course, it required me to extract the tooth and I removed the tooth and I placed it immediately with the Zeramex uh, XD Zeramex implant. Now, the P6 implant, which you saw just now, is external hex and the XT uh, version now is uh, with an internal hex. And you can see the, uh, the tissue response and uh, the results we've had now is, is it's, it's fantastic. Um, in terms of the 
the gingival healing, you can see that the area where I've actually made incisions before, you can see that it's still healing. But this is an x-ray, which a photograph which I take routinely for all my patients two weeks after I place the crown. And you can see that the, certainly you can't see the, any form of hint of uh, anything underlying. If it had been titanium, I could have probably seen maybe a very gentle light gray hue or so. Next. And this is the tissue response is the same. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, in fact, I think it in fact will probably attract less plaque than a natural teeth. Next. So we use plenty of uh, bone foundation materials and the bone graft we use are either human bone or bone substitutes. In regards to home, human bone, you can use the patient's own bone where it's an allograft. I can use other sort of allografts which are available. You can buy uh, uh, many versions of uh, this where you can use um, other human bone, demineralized of course, and, and use it. Some patients have an aversion to this. I personally wouldn't use that for my own, but many clinicians who actually use um, uh, human bone, um, swear by it and say that's the best thing they know in terms of achieving a good um, biological response for their patients. And of course, you've got tons of uh, bone substitutes of xenografts, bovine, porcine, the list goes on. Um, some people also like to use uh, things which include uh, bone morphogenic proteins, and some actually mix BMPs with um, you know, a mix of the um, calcium hydroxyapatite of calcium phosphate uh, sort of bone uh, bone graft that they can find in the market. Basically, any bone graft will work as long as it's used uh, appropriately to with regards to the manufacturer's instructions. But there will be some materials that perform better than others. Next. So in terms of what happens, uh, bone loss and soft tissue changes, and this is the primary reason why we want to place an immediate implant, because 30 to 60% of the bone is lost within a period of three to six months. In fact, if you look at the study over here, it says that the facial bone where it's very thin, if it's one mm or less, you see almost 62% of the bone height being lost after eight weeks of healing. That's a very short time. And typically we've always tell patients to come back after four months or three months of healing, and then we place an implant. So for those implants that have been placed into a socket after four months, you already are telling the patient that I'm not gonna give you a successful aesthetic outcome. So it's critical that we consider um, where obviously uh, clinically appropriate and indicated in terms of medical history and smoker history and diabetes, of course, you have to consider the potential use of um, an immediate implant and certainly consider bone augmentation as early as possible. Next. We all know this, okay? Ideally two millimeters of buccal bolt anterior to the implant in the maxillary region, but of course, sometimes we are not privileged or lucky enough to be in such a situation to see such amounts of thick bone. Uh, we also know that as far as possible, we should place the implant 1.5 one to 1 2 millimeters away from the adjacent roots. In the molars, in the molar region, of course, we will like at least one millimeter of buccal bone around the implant to allow stability of the buccal plate. But in some cases, we've also done this ourselves. I'm sure for those of you who place lots of implants, you'd had situations as to where it compromise these dimensions, these dimensions that I already mentioned to you. Next. Next, please. So, uh, sorry, one, one slide back. So in this case here, I mean, there have been many instances where I'm sure all of us would have been um, worrying, what would be the material I used to reconstruct this? And of course you tell your nurse, please bring the bone graph and your nurse knows no other bone graph apart from the one that you most regularly use, which is BioOS, BioGuide, or you know, the tons of other materials you would use out there, of course, but these are very common and prominent ones. But the question is, of course, are these the only materials that are available which will give us the best tissue response? There's a continual study going to uh, BioOS and Bio, BioGuide. And of course, the company is always sending uh, you know, lots of invites to recent uh, new outcomes, new research uh, results, and, and they'll publish this or give us webinars about how valuable uh, BioOS is in implant uh, surgery. But once again, as I said, if you have had the chance of raising a flat after BioOS has been placed, or for the matter, any other bone substitute, you'll find this poor integration of um, whatever alloplastic material you've used. And of course, if you use human bone, you'll find that there's 
very rapid resorption. So what do you do when you don't have uh, sufficient bone? Next. You will have to use a GBR, of course. And of course, the ideal GBR would have lots of properties which you want to fulfill. It has to be biocompatible. It has to integrate with the surrounding tissues. It has to allow cell migration to occur so that whatever's on the, the support of strut or the lattice, you want to make sure that the osteoblasts and, osteo osteoblast and osteocytes can colonize that. You want it to be easily manageable in the clinic. You want your nurse to be easily helping you to cut it for you. You want to wet it. You want to be able to mold it into shape. But principally, you want it to make sure you want to make sure that it can actually keep and preserve that important blood. That important blood clot that comes out is the most crucial bit, which is the thing that is going to make the bone anterior to implant or surrounding your implant. So apart from having good mechanical and physical properties, you want to make sure that whatever you're using is wettable and certainly wettable to the point that you can keep the space so that your coagulum will remain. Next slide. With regards to the principles of a GBR, primary closure, this is up for discussion, of course. In many instances these days, I don't use primary closure for, for my GBR, uh, to allow angiogenesis. So in which case, if you use lots of very, very uh, small particle sort of uh, bone grafts, you prevent vascular genesis and angiogenesis. In fact, I quite routinely do not use uh, the small particles of uh, any form of calcium hydroxyapatite. I try to use a larger sort of um, bone particles. In terms of space maintenance, space, space maintenance is crucial, as I said. If everything is flattened, then you use the, lose the chance of regenerating a good um, new vowed bone. And of course, you need to make sure the blood clot stability is, is, uh, is, is critical. So I tell my patients in terms of um, post-op instructions what not to do. I tell them very, very uh, often, not to over rinse uh, in the first 24 to 48 hours whilst the blood clot is uh, undergoing stabilization. Next. Okay, and then of course, we have used tons of biomaterials and the ones we know what quite commonly are uh, uh, polytetrafluoroethene, um, tons of other uh, materials, for example, calcium phosphate, where some dentists don't even use membranes these days. In general, you would use either a resorbable or a non-resorbable membrane. The vast majority of us would always use a resorbable membrane because it's that much easier because there isn't a secondary step involved. Uh, for, those, for those of us who have been using titanium meshes, titanium meshes are great, but I'll tell you now, uh, and actually removing is not difficult actually, but there is a secondary procedure involved. And of course, stripping the periosteum off something that's already healed uh, is not obviously something that is uh, uh, healthy. Uh, in some cases where there's no option, when we want to reconstruct such a large defect, we certainly would look at, at uh, titanium being one of the only options. But hang on, here comes another material along and uh, enter osteopore. Next. So as we already know, there's resolvable and resolvable. And as here you see the titanium mesh and your properties can, can mold it and stuff like that. But what happens when you have a material which can be molded what happens when you have a material which can actually do all the very things that we've always wanted? You want it to ideally be moldable. You want it to be flat. You want it to be biocompatible. You want a good uh, network, all your bone cells and blood to actually wet the surface and stay there and grow. You want vascular genesis to occur, angiogenesis to occur. This is the reason why I looked at osteopore as a viable material for uh, using in my... Um, dental blood surgeries, and I'd like to present some findings to you. Next. Uh, next. Okay, so whenever there's any form of uh, studies that are shown or thrown to us, we'd always look and ask ourselves whether we believe these studies. And we'll look at animals, uh, animal studies, we look at the longevity of these studies, but Ultimately, what is the most important to us is actually seeing it demonstrated in our own patients. So we would always look at new studies and the, the rep will come to us and tell us this and that. But of course, we'd be using one particular material and then we try this new material on one or two patients. And then after a period of time, we look at this. If you're very lucky, the, the number of patients that you've done this for is large, you might be convinced to change. Now, in my case, I did not do a randomized control study with all my patients. I just simply stopped using 
uh, the, the typical sort of uh, bone materials I've been using. And I tried to use something completely different. And osteopore has been a bit of a learning curve for me. But with regards to patients who have insufficient bone volume, for those who know my implant practice, uh, a lot of the patients I see come in with extremely atrophic maxillas. Um, I do zygomatic implants and I do all of four procedures for these patients. And for these patients, they have a very severe uh, buccal bone defects. And of course, we want something to both replace the, uh, the bone defect and also augment the soft tissue profile of such patients as well. Next. So uh, our good friend Lim Jing has really talked to us about uh, osteomesh. Osteomesh is polycaptral lactone. It's an osteoconductive scaffold, which allows you to either use it in conjunction with both of your choice. Bovine um, um, allows your osteo, so, so your bio os and bio guide. Uh, you can just use it on its own and just hope that the blood clot will form. Let's look at some studies that I've done and some clinical examples to see what has happened and how I've used this uh, process. The whole key point in this, of course, is you want this scaffold to accept the blood clot and allow any form of growth factors which will allow osteoprom osteopromotion to allow healing in the presence of your titanium implant and for you to restore the bone defect sufficiently in an elegant and efficient manner so that you don't have to have the patient wait too long to have the implants in their tooth or teeth in their mouths. Next. Now, if you look at a titanium mesh, it's extremely stiff, okay? But it requires a secondary surgery. And of course, some patients don't like the fact that there's metal inside. Many instances, you would see that the sharp edges will actually cause extrusion of the mesh. And sometimes you have to go in uh, cut this off and trim this off, or even use a burr at times. Now for collagen meshes, it doesn't have, well, the, for the vast majority of them, they don't have that much of a memory. So here we want some memory of the membrane, and here we don't want too much of memory for the membrane. But of course, in the instances where the collagen is of uh, animal uh, derivative, there are lots of religious concerns. And of course, it is very, very difficult for you to uh, keep in place at times, um, some of us use a double membrane technique where we cut the, the membrane and put one on top of the other. We initially wet it and then a second one to keep in place. And some of us use some tacks, of course. And enter osteomesh. It's a semi-flexible uh, membrane, but it can be heated with warm saline in a nice water bath and it will retain its physical shape. The great news for you is that after 18 to 24 months, it will disappear with, and with no trace. And uh, it's, uh, hence, it's bioresorbable. And as, as far as the studies tell us, because of its longevity of use, it's non-toxic. Next. So let's look at how we are meant to be using osteomesh. This is critical. Of course, uh, if you were to use this, there would be a representative that comes down to show this to you. You want to choose the appropriate size for the osteomesh. You remove it and you place it in a, a sterile bowl with saline. Now the saline, you can actually place warm saline. So you, what you should do is get a, a water bath. The water bath sits your uh, warm saline, of course. And depending on what temperatures you put it to, depends on the mesh thickness you use. And then you allow it to soak for at least, at least 10 seconds. If you leave it for a longer period of time, it's much easier for it to mold. Now you then shape it to the desired shape you form. Do remember when you want to trim it, you can trim and trim it to any shape you want. But please do remember to remove the borders. The borders are there because of the, the, the way it's actually made. It's made by the, the 3D printing process. You would need to have uh, a, 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 the borders around the mesh removed, okay? Now, in terms of how you fixate this, um, I've tried many techniques, um, including tacks and sutures. The one that I prefer the most is sutures. Why? It's much easier and faster to finish. I don't have another foreign body inside. Uh, but for those who like to use uh, osteomesh, you can actually uh, use your screws or your tacks through the osteomesh to engage bone on the other side. For those of you who do not wish to use um, a bone tacks, you can certainly just use sutures. Um, I'll just use simple interrupted sutures. You can certainly place some horizontal mattress sutures to just to, prove it, to allow eversion of the edges for better healing. And of course, if you score the periosteal flap, just because you have a lot of uh, uh, laxity in, the, in the, the flap, you should be able to keep everything in place. What would would be a poor outcome is if you do not um, score or fan the periosteum for, who, for those of you who are not fanning this and allow tension-free closure to allow because 
the amount of osteomesh you use, the thickness will, will cause problems in the, the short term if you do not realize how much of uh, flexibility and laxity you need to allow the, the mucoparasol flap to have. Next. Okay, so this is a patient you can see who has uh, failing maxillary dentition and obviously is completely dentulous with the lower jaw. And you can see over here how much of little bone this person has in the anterior maxillary wall. Now, if you were to do such a case and said implants should be, should be, if the patient just wants implants, you're probably looking at titanium mesh, you're looking at taking, uh, you know, hip grafts, you're looking at stabilization of the bone uh, with uh, this, this, this mesh for maybe four to six months, take off the whole thing and, uh, and place implants thereafter. So the patient gets rehabilitated after a very, very long time. But crucially on the CT scan, whenever you look at a CT scan again, please do remember such defects also affect the soft tissue profile. It also affects the patient's sort of nose position. And when they smile, of course, see the nose just literally collapse. And not just the fact that the nasal spine has undergone uh, resorption as they go older, this uh, very, very ugly concave defect adds onto the ears when they look at themselves in the mirror. Next. So let me give you some case presentations. And obviously the easiest one to talk about is osteomesh with particulate bone. I have used osteomesh in reconstructing following epical cystic removal. I've used osteomesh in the implant, immediate implant loading, all on four. And what I do and how I use these uh, techniques to help improve my success rates. For the first case, next please. Okay, so let's look at this patient. This patient came in with a Maryland bridge. Uh, he basically had um, a right and central incisor and, and a lateral incisor, which had to be removed. I removed that and I saw a huge defect, severe buckle wall uh, defect. And of course, in this particular instance, uh, since I was using a new biomaterial, I didn't want to take and risk any form of um, <laughs> implant loss. So I did um, a very, very cautious approach, I decided to graft. So I placed um, uh, calcium hydroxy crystals and I then obviously used uh, PRF. I like to use um, platelet-rich fibrin in my, um, my clinical practice. I, I use a lot of it because I believe in the biological properties of it, but it also enables me to allow the bone to be packed to whatever contour I want and it stays there, okay? And on top of this, I use osteomesh and if you see the osteomesh, it looks rather thick and unwieldy and ungiving. Uh, these are times when I use the a thicker version of osteomesh, not because I wanted to, but that's how I started off. And, and over a period of time, I've learned to use different sort of thicknesses of osteomesh. I closed the whole defect with four silk. And you can see from pre-op where there's a huge uh, uh, buccal concavity. Uh, we, we see very nice bone formation four months uh, later, as you can see from the post-operative uh, CBCT. And of course, the patient, when the patient smiles, you can automatically see that there is symmetry in terms of what was on the left side and the right side. On the right side, the patient had lost the, the buccal prominence due to the fact he lost his roots. And what we just done, of course, is to overpack it just to allow to ensure that there will be sufficient bone uh, prior to implant placement. Next. So why PRF? I mean, in my hands, PRF is a very quick procedure. It's very easy to take blood. And you should try it yourself. And I take it very commonly from the cubital foster. You can take it, of course, from the, from the houseman's friend on the radial, on the, uh, um, near, the, near the anatomical snuff box. Um, osteomesh is an osteoconductive scaffold. What more if you add both particulate bone graft and PRF, which is full of cells and growth factors? You will see instantly at two weeks that your, the whole uh, healing construct is very healthy. The ginger will look extremely pink and not an angry red. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, of course, for patients who are not smoking or so, the result is impeccable. The reason is because there's tons of uh, growth factors in there. The immune system is not severely uh, challenged. There are tons of uh, white blood cells in there as well. And the most amazing thing, of course, is hemostasis is achieved almost instantly. There are patients who bleed after implant surgery. There are patients who bleed after extractions. You place PRF in there, the patient stops bleeding. Okay, And it's also the whole thing is actually very very sticky. As a result, we believe that there's much better cell migration and proliferation in all that lattice that's surrounding your osteomesh. 
or if it's, you, know, you still want to use a bone graft and a, and a uh, bone membrane, the PRF is actually very uh, useful. Now, I've used OsteoMesh in my practice with PRF um, to improve my success rates. And you may want to ask, of course, why have you not just used OsteoMesh on your own, on this phone just alone? I have, but in the first studies that I, that I started off, I was worried because using a new material, I want to be responsible because at the end of the day, we just want the right result for patients. So I wanted to use the, the, the properties of OsteoMesh, but I was concerned that there might be potential of uh, me losing the membrane. And hence the reason why I decided to place PRF as another biological membrane above my particular bone graft. So let's look at some examples of this next. So in this patient over here, I removed a large cyst. You can see the cyst is sizable. Um, this is obviously one of those apical radicular cysts. And uh, the patient didn't want any form of retreatment, thank goodness. So we extracted the, the tooth, the lateral incisor, and you can see a very large bone wall defect, bony wall defect. And of course, you would want to remove and decorticate any form of uh, granulation tissue in the area. Then osteomesh was just used. In this case, osteomesh was just used purely on its own. There was no PRF. I did not use anything else. And the reason for that is because I wanted that osteomess just to do the job of both the bone graft and the uh, membrane and just simple sutures to close the wound. Okay, next. Another instance of a, a patient where I placed an implant in the lower mandible, uh, sorry, in the anterior mandible, you see there's a large defect over here. Um, now the strategy for such defects, as we would typically do, we would place uh, some form of a bone, bone graft and pack it, pack the whole socket really tight. And then one may want to use collagen membranes to go around the entire, both the lingual and the buccal aspect and, and um, lock that down, secure it down with sutures. Uh, as you can see over here, what I did was I placed uh, the implant there. I just made a space for, for the implant within the osteomesh and I did not use a bone graft this time. I just allowed the osteomesh to be the membrane and allow uh, osseous regeneration buckle to the implant. And you can see instantly that there is a very different uh, sort of bone architecture buckle to uh, where the implant is and especially where the osteomesh is as compared to the left side versus the right side. Next. Okay, now for those who know me well, I do a lot of all on force and I love doing all on force because to me, I, I gain no better happiness by seeing a patient smile by the end of the day. Okay, of course, all of us like that. I like to see it surgically, where a patient has had a denture and been wearing an unwieldy denture for years. Um, I would like to see a patient smile and say that they don't have the palate covered, and of course, they don't have to remove it. But in some cases, I see some severe resorbed ridges. And you can see in this case, this is a very extensive buckle defect. And so, um, actually, this slide should have come a bit earlier, but um, in terms of complexity, I suppose the audit scene is correct because here you can see uh, a particulate bone graft. In this case, I've used something called osteon and I've used uh, PRF. And then you can see the yellow part of it is all PRF. Together, it forms something called sticky bone. And sticky bone then ends up having another layer of osteo uh, mesh in front of it. So it's almost like a sandwich layer. So I've used a PCL mesh on top of my uh, sticky bone. And you can see on the bottom right hand side, you can see the original contour of the con on um, concavity uh, on the buccal alveolus. And now you can see so much of um, bone form in the buccal region. Now, the interesting thing of this is that not is just, we don't just reconstruct the bony defect because PCL is now on the um, side of the gingiva as well. We find it actually augments the thickness of the gingiva. So the patients that have come to me after all in surgery keep telling me that they look much younger. And if you remember how a Botox was discovered, Botox was discovered because the Carruthers, uh, a famous dermatologist, injected patients for blepharospasms. And the patient kept coming back because they felt that the blepharospasm, although it had been treated, um, was helping his forehead look much better. So when uh, Dean Carruthers said, why do you keep coming back for your blepharospasm injections? Because I, as far as I can see, you don't have that anymore. The patient said, hey, I think my, my forehead looks hell much better because the Botox that you injected has, has, has uh, changed my, my forehead lines. I don't have a forehead lines anymore. So it's that accent, accidental finding that has led to the cosmetic use of Botox. And in this instance, here I have done an expensive procedure for my all on for a patient, but the patient then tells me at the end of the day 
I'm very happy that my, my face and my lip looks more propped up than it was ever done before. So you can see that there is some truth in terms of what it can produce in terms of volumetrically for a patient who has a very, very severe sort of aging face in a trophic maxilla. Next slide, please. And now, of course, we get a bit smarter in terms of using a much thinner membrane because we've had extrusions. And just like um, uh, Raymond, who's presented uh, some, um, well, given some slides to Ostipo and the living presented, uh, in those instances where the graft osteomesh is actually extruded, for the vast majority, uh, I would say probably 95%, they're not infected, which is actually quite startling, especially if you look at the fact that there's so many holes uh, or in inserations that uh, the mesh has. It's just a simple use of a scalpel or a surgical scissors, any way you don't need and then it magically heals over. In this particular instance, I've used uh, a borderless mesh. So I've actually cut away the mesh, uh, so the borders of the mesh. And then I've used two individual pieces for uh, implant places, upper left one and upper right one. And it's a very simple closure, of course. Some of you may argue and say, why have you used uh, a silk? Some of you may say, well, couldn't you have used uh, you know, sutures that are much smaller than that? Um, it worked. And I'm happy to, res to say that the result is still outstanding. I would like to show more results, of course, as uh, the next time I speak. Uh, some of these patients are uh, work in progress, of course, but it's amazing to see uh, the way the tissue looks all just immediately post-surgery. You can see how much of uh, reconstruction of the soft tissue defect was there before. Next. Okay, so here you go. Um, when I first started, of course, I was using very thick uh, meshes. Um, and of course, then I started telling um, Osteopor team that I needed a much thinner uh, mesh. And we went for now much, much thinner meshes. And the sole purpose of the mesh, of course, is to keep all that bone graft in. And for me, in this instance, I became even braver. I stopped using the particular bone mesh, a uh, particular bone graft. I stopped using the PRF. I literally just placed a 0.4 millimeter osteomesh buckley retention free closure. And in this instance, it still gives me the same effect that I've had before. Of course, uh, this is not a severe defect compared to the one that I had before. But in general, now I'm trying not to use uh, the bone graft and I'm trusting the fact osteomesh uh, it can be used just with the, the body's um, a, a clot, of course, to form new bone. Next. So um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, osteomess in my use has been a bit of an experience and there has been a learning curve, but my objective is to find the ideal biomaterial, which allows me to do a bit of the various things. It has to be biocompatible. It has to have a good tissue response and we don't want uh, problems with regards to extrusions and stuff like this. But here we want a case where we don't use that particular bone grafts. For those implant surgeons amongst us who've used tons of bone graft material, the number one thing that happens when you have uh, bone grafts is that material extrudes. When particular bone extrudes, it's very annoying. It's like sand. And the patient will call you and say, there's doctor, there's this white thing that's coming out. And of course, invariably, we have to see the patient slowly tease out these white bone particles. This has been happening since age immemorial. In the case of me using a very thin uh, amount of um, a thin mesh, what I'm getting now is a soft tissue profile that I want. I'm using the patient's own blood to form new bone. And the mesh that is allowing me to do the GBR is osteomesh. Combined with the fact that you can actually shape it to what you want, I don't think I'll need to use for me at this stage, of course, in private practice, hardly the need for me to use titanium meshes that once I would have used when I was a maxillofacial registrar. Um, my advice is for, for those who are interested, perhaps you can get in touch with the osteopore team and perhaps arrange for uh, a small, uh, just a small little demonstration as to how pliable the material is and see how you use it. I'm sure they'll be happy to guide you through your first case. I certainly am there for any form of um, uh, clinical sort of tips and guidance. Uh, for the vast majority of patients, of, uh, sorry, of doctors who start off initially, uh, you may be concerned that this is going to be a difficult product to use. My advice would be to choose the case you use this uh, for. And certainly, once you've done your first case, 
you'll be more keen to use the second and the third and the fourth. In terms of what does it do, do for you financially, of course. Now, finance should never be your concern or object with regards to performing the best sort of uh, implant restorative um, case for your patients. If assuming you have to restore bone with a GBR technique, please use the best materials. But of course, I'll tell you now, if you just use one material versus two or even three, which means particulate bone, collagen membrane, and tack. If you can just use one material, in this case, which I'm using osteoporphyr, I've just used one material instead of three. And of course, some of you may argue and say, you don't use three, you use two. But however, I'm getting a soft tissue response, which I'm not being able to get using particulate uh, bone graft and uh, certainly collagen membrane. I'd like to thank all of you for um, coming for this talk this evening. It is a, I enjoyed giving this talk to all of you. I love to share my results uh, with, with all of you in person, uh, if possible. And I once again like to thank uh, Osteopor for giving me this opportunity to address all of you. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions.